Today we will talk about the physically based shading in general and uh, in Unity 5. So uh, you've already seen some demos and there are more coming. Uh, you can see all, all those images, they are a result of our work with the physically based shading and the demos, testing and demonstrating them. Uh, yep. So in Unity 5, we have a one single physically based shader. Uh, it's called standard shader and it uh, underneath of that shader, we actually have a multitude of variations of smaller shaders, uh, different versions for mobiles, for the high ends, and all that. But first, I will start talking about the physically based shading in general. And yeah, here you can see some screenshots as well. It's all done with a single shader. Different environments, you can see how what a wide uh, range of materials the shader can cover. It's pretty standard motivation. Uh, nowadays, I think not any, not any, that many people ask question why physically based shading. Uh, I want to start with a bit, uh, tell how we started uh, with the physically based shading. It started in a butterfly effect demo approximately two and a half years ago. And first uh, we, we were looking at the, for inspiration at the mental ray, uh, mental images architectural shader. And it allowed to create, uh, to render both metals and plastics and quite a wide range. Uh, afterwards, uh, we have looked quite a lot of the Disney's work. It's a really good talk they gave at Seagraph, and it's a really, I think, very thorough uh, dive into the physically based shading. And essentially, our shader is the sort of implementation of the same Disney uh, wor workflow. So, we can, we can pretty much um, subdivide all the materials around us in a two very rough and uh, large groups, uh, which are very distinctive between each other. It's metals and everything else, essentially. And everything else, plastic, rock, water, it's all dielectric, so-called dielectrics. They don't, they different from the metals. They look differently. Uh, and basically they call the electrics because the electricity doesn't really pass that well through them, unlike in metals. And uh, there are a bit more complicated dielectrics like cloth and organic. The main complexity there is they are usually made out of uh, multiple layers of fibers, intertwined fibers, which though the material itself uses the same kind of it's the same physical property, but once you have a multiple layers or once you have a fibers, uh, the, the look of it becomes kind of distinctive, specific. So the electrics. Uh, usually they surround us everywhere, uh, and uh, we quite well know what, how do they look and what are the distinguishable traits. Uh, so. The easiest to say, the electrics, they, they have very strong Fresnel. So if you look at the electric, if you take a, like a rock, for instance, or marble, in this case, marble ball, and if you polish it, you can see some reflection if you look at it directly, but the reflection becomes really, really strong on the edges of the ball. If you look directly into it, you can't really see yourself. The, 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 there is some reflection. Uh, but it's not strong when the light hits it directly, uh, but it becomes really increasing on the edges. And another thing about the dielectrics, they don't, uh, the reflection doesn't change the color. It's always the same color. It doesn't matter what's the color of the material, it's always will be the, the, the reflected light will be the same color, despite of the underlying material. So this Fresnel thing, what is it? what happens with the light. So uh, the, the 
materials themselves on a, on a microscopic, on an atomic level, uh, the structure is such that if the light comes directly from above from the, into the surface, uh, there is actually the space between those molecules, is, between the atoms, is quite large relatively. So if the light goes from the top, it just goes direct, almost straight through. Uh, however, if the light comes at the angle, uh, to this interface between the air and the, and the material, the light will most likely will bounce. Um, so it's kind of strange, but uh, we don't think that way. But actually, rock, uh, the light can enter if you put the light bulb on top of it. The light will penetrate into the rock through the surface very, very easily. Uh, and afterwards, the light will do something inside the material. But uh, the, the, the surface itself, the light can penetrate quite easily from, from if it comes from the top. Um, now, so what happens on the, on the, on the surface? So, So-called specular reflection. That's what we, we call it, specular. Uh, the light bounces, as, a, as, as I said before. However, the the way how the light bounces will definitely depend on the roughness of the surface. If the surface is really smooth, uh, then you can see you can see quite well. Ref, ref, reflection is quite almost mirror. Uh, so the surface itself defines how the light, how the bounced light will spread. You can see the free helmets underneath, and you can see how, depending on the, on the, on the material, they are becoming more and more ma mate. Actually, the amount of light reflected is the same on all those three helmets. It's just that the light is more spread. The, the, and we perceive that as a, as a weaker reflection. But actually, the amount of light is reflected is the same. So the, the rest of the light that didn't reflect will go inside the material. And that is the same for both waters, rocks, uh, for all dielectrics. Lots of light will go inside of the material and start bouncing in, inside under the surface. And, that's, and then it will bounce back from there in, in all various directions. And that is how we perceive the color of the materials, of the rock, or the water, or mm, plastic. Uh, the difference between the rock and the water is essentially uh, there is much less mm, the light can pass through the through the rock mm, through the molecules through the uh, crystals uh, of the rock it it can't really pass it it's usually is absorbed or bounced back but in the water the transmission is much it's we perceive it as a transparent. Uh, light will just go through, through it. Uh, but the color of the rock itself, it's the bouncing light. It's not, it doesn't happen on the surface, actually. It happens underneath the surface. That's why it becomes the same color as the, of the material. And that's how we perceive the color of the, of the rock. And it's pretty much the same. It's called subsurface scattering. It's the same thing as happens in our skin. It's just the distance of this subsurface scattering in a rock is much, much uh, shorter. In a skin, the light can travel considerably longer than in a rock. So what makes, uh, what makes those different, why the rock looks different from the plastic? Well, actually, they mostly look different because of the color and because of the roughness of the surface. If you start, to, if you polish a marble, it, re it becomes really hard to distinguish it from the, just the polished plastic. Uh, there is a very, very slight variation in the amount of the light. Uh, different materials, different dielectrics will bounce at different amounts of light back. Uh, and it's very small, subtle difference. It's usually between 2 to 4% for the plastics, glass, water. Uh, however, the crystals and gems, they are a bit outliers. They can 
they can reflect a little bit more light, uh, around 10%. So this difference is quite small. Uh, however, that's, um, it's worth to, to simulate in some cases. So let's look at the metals now. So the main difference, they are really good mi mirrors. They reflect all the light. And uh, reflected light usually will change color slightly. And the light cannot enter the metal. That's why they cannot be transparent. It's almost impossible. You can, you can, you can make a very, very thin layer of, of metal, uh, really, really thin. Then it can pass a little bit of the light. But normally, no light can enter the metal. And all the light is actually reflected. So why, is, why that happens? That is the, essentially the main difference between the dielectrics and metals. As I said before, in the dielectrics, the light can, if it hits from the top, it can easily enter. The, the, the surface and start doing the subsurface scattering. Uh, in metals, however, there is a lot of free electrons. And those fr free electrons, they create, a once the light hits the surface, uh, they create an electromagnetic field which deflects the light. So it doesn't allow light to come into inside the surface. That's why we think that mm, the metals are very good mi mirrors, because all the light is bounced back. Uh, the fraction of the light, however, will be absorbed by the surface itself. Unlike, unlike in the dielectrics, the absorption happens under, un underneath the surface. In metals, the absorption happens usually on, on, its, on the surface itself. And that's why, what creates a tint in a specular reflection. It's a small tint. And that's because some of the light is, most of the light is reflected, but some percentage of the certain wavelengths, uh, they are more likely to be uh, absorbed and become a heat. So what makes different metals? Basically two parameters. It's a, uh, the tint of the specular reflection, and uh, again, the microstructure, how rough, or how polished, how smooth they are. And you can see the examples here. It goes from the basically a chromey look and uh, more rough. It's the same, the three images here, the, uh, the same uh, silver-ish kind of metal uh, with just different amount of um, roughness on them. And here, uh, it's more of a kind of golden copper. You can see the tint a little bit in the color. So it sounds simple, right? Just two type of materials, just metals and dielectrics. Uh, we say, OK, the metals, the light doesn't really enter under the surface. Then there is no diffuse because of, because of that, so it's very strong specular, uh, a little bit tinted specular for the metal, for the non-metals, for the dielectrics. Well, we know it's a strong Fresnel, and we say there is very, sorry, very weak uh, specular reflection. However, in reality, materials are much more complicated and mostly because they are not pure, because they are not polished, and because they are not, uh, they usually, it's a mix of different materials. And here you can see on the, on the left side, you can see it's a metal, but it's very rusty, so uh, there is no strong reflection of it. It becomes very, very diffuse, though it's a metal, but. And here you can see some sort of a turp, uh, turpoline, I don't really know how to pronounce it. Uh, it's a, it's a some sort of a fabric. Uh, but you could, it's a, theoretically, it's a uh, dielectric, not, not metal, but you can see that it tints the specular reflection. The reflection, if you look on the, on the wood, it's much whiter reflection. But however, on the fabric itself, it becomes very blue. So it's a dielectric, it's a, it's, a, it's a cloth, but it acts a little bit like, a, starts acting a little bit like a metal to our eyes. Yeah. 
So as I said, the rust oxidation, mixing of the different materials, that's what makes metals look different. Um, the Fresnel, when we say the Fresnel is very strong in edges, that is only true for polished objects. Uh, once you have a very rough uh, surface, the Fresnel actually starts to die out. And for the very rough surfaces, you won't have any, any reflectivity on the edge. That's quite easy to see in real life. So that, uh, that is the reason why we have, in our standard shader, we picked to have a so-called diffuse specular or uh, albedo reflectivity or specular gloss. It's, it's the same names for the same thing, essentially. Uh, so we picked this workflow because it allows e to use scan data easier. It allows to create those uh, both rusty metals. It allows to create a fabrics. E maybe not, it's hard to say if it's easier, but uh, it allows to create them. In the metallic workflow, usually have additional tweaks to do that. So we picked the few specular or that. However, it is likely that in the future we will have metallic workflow as an option as well. So okay. So we look, talked a little bit of the theory. So how does that translate into this working with the shader? So I, I want to pick two things, basically the specularity and the, gloss, uh, the glossiness or what we call smoothness, uh, and just explain them a little bit more uh, because they are very crucial to see when you set up your materials. So what is this specular thing is actually, especially when it's an input for the shader? So it means simply uh, the amount of reflected light when, when the light is hitting the surface straight from the top, so-called normal incidence, when light hits from the top. And with the specular core, we can control that, how reflective the surface will be when the light is hitting it straight from the top. And if we take a look at the databases of the different materials, uh, you can see those curves, kind of. And this curve here, it shows this is an angle to the surface on this axis and the amount of ref reflectance, amount of the light reflected on this axis. So you can see uh, for the plastic on the first, uh, first graph here, the plastic goes really, really, really low at the start. It's around 4% here and then the Fresnel kicks in really strong. Right. So that's very expected. That is for the uh, polished plastic. That's how it will behave. And uh, there is this index of refraction, so-called. You can find them in the database, and it's really easy to convert from the index of refraction to, to, draw, to draw this curve here. And so basically, for this, this point here at the start, at the, at the, when the light hits the surface directly, that's where it's this 4% of reflectance, and that's what we will encode in the specular color. Now, we can look at the, some crystals. Uh, they are, as I mentioned before, they are outliers in the, in the dielectrics, and they have kind of a bit higher start here. They don't start that low. They start a little bit higher. They have a little bit more reflectance around, say, this crystal specifically was 13%. Uh, 13%, and then it goes with the quick in the Fresnel as well. But if we take a look at the aluminium, a metal, clearly a metal, you can see that it starts really, really high because it almost always reflects almost all the energy. The reflectance is almost constant throughout the, throughout the sur surface. But what, what is important is the specular. It defines at the, the amount of reflectance for our, shader, for our material at the normal incidence. So how does that translate to the colors? Because those percents, they are in linear space. And we want to have it in a color space, which is gamma or sRGB space. So we just do simple math. It's a simple, simple to convert from linear to, to sRGB. And then we get these values. For 4%, it's 60. <laughs> uh, for 15%, it's this. And it's almost white. And you can see the colors here. So you can just pick them in a picker. Uh, in, a uh, in a shader, you can just pick this color, and your material will become plastic or 
crust some sort of a crystal or aluminum, silver. Sorry, I mixed here things. It should be. I had aluminum in our slide. But so if we look at the at the metals, because for the dielectrics it's pretty easy. You you set uh, usually you set specular quite low. It's a monochromatic. Uh, it's quite low, uh, quite dark gray. But for the metals, it's very important to match this color because that's what defines what type of metal it is. And uh, as well, we can look at the databases and essentially, uh, this is a kind of simplified way to, to, to look at, at, lo to those, at those things. You can take a look at the databases and you can find those curves and then you can see how uh, in a different spectrum of light, how the different wavelengths of the light uh, how much are they absorbed or how much they are ref reflected. And you can notice with that with pretty much all the metals. I couldn't find any metal uh, not um, behaving in a different way, but uh, so far the metals I've seen, they always have, they either white or they go into the red tint. This, this is always usually like curve going upwards here. So it seems all the metals are either white pinkish, yellowish, never blue. And here it's as well taking, uh, taking data from the database and converted, converted from those kind of graphs into the usable colors. So just pick one of those colors and you get the material, metal. It's kind of simple, smoothness. Well, it just controls how blurry is your reflection. Easy. That's, as I said, because of the micro microstructure of the surface. The light either scatters or goes in one direction. However, the other important topic uh, of the smoothness is that it controls, in our shader, in, it seems in reality as well, it controls the the Fresnel, how much of the reflection you get on the, on the edges. For the very, very smooth surfaces, we have very strong Fresnel. For very rough surfaces, we have almost no Fresnel on the edges. And here you can see uh, it's, it's inspired by the Disney uh, as well, Disney Diffuse. They noticed that all the plastics, all the very rough surfaces, uh, they have some sort of a, they, they, you can say it's a retro reflection. Uh, the light on the very edge of the surface, it actually becomes a little bit brighter. Uh, and the same thing with the cloth. Uh, it's essentially all the rough surfaces behave a little bit like that. So in our shader, we do the same. Once, once the smoothness uh, goes to zero, once you start getting very, very rough surface, you start getting a little bit of this kind of brightening on the edge as well. Uh, that is kind of nice because it, it, it's a cheap way to simulate the cloth. So with the same shader, if you take, uh, take the shader and you start uh, reducing the smoothness, you, you can get something which looks closer to cloth. Of course, it's not proper cloth simulation, Mm, it, but it's pretty decent, I think. And it's very nice to have just one slider to control, uh, to go from the polished plastic to uh, something looking like a cloth. Okay, uh, I want to do the, just a, some sort of a breakdown of the shader, just go through the, uh, briefly, how things happen underneath. So first, it's a direct light. It's a simple evaluation of the direct light. Um, you can see the normal maps here. They are multiplied with the diffuse color. Makes sense. That's the part which we said that the light goes into the surface and bounces back. So we multiply the color of the, uh, of the diffuse color with the uh, incoming lighting, and that is essentially called a diffuse reflection. Next, uh, indirect light. 
uh, indirect light in Unity comes from the either light probes, uh, if it's a dynamic object, or from the light maps, if it's a static object. Uh, in this case, uh, it's a, it comes from the light probes. Uh, you can see very, uh, very vague light coming from all directions. And next, we, what we do is we multiply it with the ambient occlusion. So the ambient occlusion essentially allows you to create creases and cavities. And uh, it doesn't affect the direct light, as you've seen before, but it aff affects all the indirect light. It's, that's why it's called ambient occlusion. So. Uh, the, the good thing is that if you do it this way, if, like, like we do, like we do, do it, uh, it, it doesn't, um, your light, the, the, the direct light doesn't become dirty. It shouldn't. Uh, next part is Fresnel. You can see some sort of a, it's hard to see on the projector, but there are some sort of a reflections on the edges. Very vague, but they should be there. So it's a Fresnel. Uh, that's how the metallic reflection would look like for this. And that's how the plastic, the electric reflection would look like. So. Uh, this is applied, we've applied smoothness, so basically we take the incoming uh, reflections. Uh, right now in Unity we have the reflection probe. In Unity 5 it's, it allows us to place different probes in the scene and capture the incoming, uh, incoming light, incoming Im image of the surrounding. Uh, the, those uh, are stored in the cube maps. Uh, you can, of course, use your own cube maps. Those cube maps will be blurred, so uh, different MIP chains of the cube map will store different uh, amount of blurriness. So then we can easily apply this, uh, take the data from the smoothness, it can be a texture data, and just pick the correct MIP level uh, from those cube maps to simulate the roughness of the surface. So we can see that uh, certain parts are much more, uh, much less blurry. Uh, on top of that, uh, we use, of course, specular. So the specular now allows to, to define different materials. So you can see that some parts are the, uh, like they are either rusty or um, it's just a pure dielectric, like the, the like the some sort of a cloth here. Uh, so basically, you can, you, you, you can see that as a uh, interpolation between those two versions. So kind of specular, judging from the specular, we can blur, but uh, we can interpolate between even metallic reflection or the dielectric reflection inside the shader and with the smoothness. On top of that, we add ambient occlusion. So ambient occlusion will occlude the reflections as well. So in the creases, in the cavities, you don't get reflections. The ambient occlusion is actually very important because otherwise you start getting the, because there is no shadowing in, uh, at least right now, today, it's hard to implement the shadowing when the lighting reflections are coming from the cube maps. We don't have ray tracing yet. So uh, the ambient occlusion is very important to hide incorrect reflections inside, in, in, the, in the inner parts uh, of, the, of the geometry. Like to close it to the neck, the, there should be more ambient occlusion which prevents uh, the reflections to go through this kind of part. And for the final result, we basically sum up this, the part, this part, which is the specular, kind of specular reflection. The result of that is a specular reflection. So we sum that with the diffuse reflection. And that's what you get. On top of that, we add emission. We add secondary uh, maps. We add parallax mapping. But uh, Erlen will cover a little bit of that in a moment. Does this work? 
Where do I uh, forward? Okay. All right. Uh, so now that Renalas has covered the theory, I will start talking about our implementation into Unity and how, uh, how it looks there. So first off, uh, for the artists, they're probably questioning uh, what are the real benefits for this. I can imagine that many artists are already quite accustomed to making realistic materials, and, uh, but there is still, this is a clear benefit that it's much easier to create those materials. We were hoping that this shader will uh, provide you with the tools that will be shortcuts to get to the results that you need. And also, it gives a consistent and predictable workflow. Uh, many of you that has worked with level art and graphics knows that between each level there's a different lighting condition, and that will screw up the shader or your materials and your textures. In this case, it will uh, be maintain its consistency throughout. And um, lastly, we're, um, we hope that this will be used for everyday materials, probably cover, covering like three thirds, uh, three uh, fourths, but will also enable you to give like a stylized look to your to your shader. There is already quite a lot of movies out there uh, uh, from both Disney and Pixar that are use well accustomed to using PBR shaders, but they still maintain a very stylized look to them to their art. So the standard shader. On the right side, you can see that it's um, much more compact. We decided to change the material inspector because the, to give the artist a better overview of the parameters that is in this shader. Um, previously, there was bigger thumbnails, and the user had to scroll through uh, length of pages to actually cover this amount of information. So now as you apply or uh, remove textures to your uh, material, it will fold and unfold appropriately. So it will always be maintained as compact as possible. And as you can see in the middle, there is a window there. And this is basically uh, an expanded view of the thumbnail that is not now much more small. Uh, and it's not that easy to distinguish, but with a click on the, on the thumbnail, it will open up this window. And from there, you can see your MIP maps and your alpha channels and whatever you want to look at in that. And um, so the standard shader. The primary inputs on this to be able to actually achieve uh, good looking results is the diffuse, which could be referred to as albedo. As Renalis was referring to. And you have the specular, just an RGB map. And this is one of the more important ones that defines your material type, as already discussed. You have the smoothness, which is set in the lace in the specular. And that gives the character of the surface. The roughness and the smoothness is provided in there. And that is crucial to giving the proper characteristics of this shader. It, I would say this is one of the most important maps of the whole shader that is necessary to, to give a realistic result. And the normal map, which is just a plain tangent space normal map, as previously. So additional to that, we have occlusion. There's just a grayscale map. Um, you have the height map. This is a, just a parallax map that can be used on your convenience. There is an emission that ranges through the RGB range, uh, HDR range. And um, on top of that, we have added a UV selection as well. So if you have a multi UV layered object, you can choose where, which UV you want to use for the, for the tiling and such. So you have the detail maps. That's basically a multi, like an overlay in Photoshop. Uh, it applies to diffuse and normal maps and uh, is blended by mask texture. Usually, this texture can be quite low res. Um, you also, on top of that, we have different rendering modes, which uh, gives you the opportunity to have a cut cutout shader or an alpha blended transparent shader for glass and such. Uh, the cutout shader is naturally used for, um, um, it's just an, uh, could be used for uh, trees or leaves or whatever you want to use it for. 
Uh, so the amount you, is, is just uh, stored in the diffuse alpha map of that. So lighting in 5.0. Uh, what can I say? We have done, uh, done quite a lot of changes to that. Uh, so now in the environment, uh, the, uh, there is an ambient probe that is enabled by default. You got light probes and default reflection that is set up as you start a new scene. And um, you have reflection probes as well that is fully integrated now, and light maps and HDR IBL. So the environment lighting is, of course, one of the more crucial parts to getting this shader to work and uh, tie itself into the environment. If the shader doesn't match the environment, you will have, a, of course, a superimposed impression. So the lights definitely must match environment. Including that, to be able to do that, we need to add exposure. You enable that on the, by clicking the HDR on camera, and it will be represented as well in the scene view and uh, as well as tone mapping. So you will get a very good understanding of how your shader is going to look once it's in runtime. So yeah, as you start up a new scene now, as I was talking a little bit about, you will have uh, many parameters already set up for you. So you will be basically able to drop in an object, and you will get a default light that is already working quite well with your shader. This can be actually quite useful if you want to balance your shader in a very neutral environment, instead of uh, referring to different uh, or using different HDR skies. You can use this environment as a template for your, uh, for your look. So um, uh, we have a skybox environment that is procedurally generated that is there by default. And um, you got the directional light, uh, specular refraction, and as I was saying, the procedural skybox. And it's all set in render settings. So if you, you want to replace that, you can edit that there. And we have an ambient probe as well, which is basically, uh, you could say that it's a light probe, but it's just a single one to uh, pick up the diffuse uh, contribution, actually. So uh, the image-based lighting setup. Um, you can easily specify your own IBL texture. And um, you can just do that by importing any HDR or EXR texture. and. Uh, uh, apply that there. And so, yeah, as you can see, it uses specular convolution, and you just add that into the texture import settings, and you can set up your own ambient probe now. So you got the top, equator, and bottom that will give you these uh, adjustments that is necessary to the ambient probes. Or, as always in Unity, you can script it in code. Um, so yeah, the reflection probes and the cube maps. Um, these are convoluted HDR specular and diffuse cube maps that are just generated by or baked as you go along. These are, they are just, as you create them, they're going to be convoluted and generated. Uh, as I was saying, we have got an HDR texture import now that also supports EXR files, and we actually now have an 8K re uh, maximum texture resolution also that will give you a higher defini definition on your skies and your cube maps. So an example of the painted textures, if we're going to go into that subject, there is, um, as you can see on this texture, there is hardly any lighting information stored in the texture whatsoever. It's uh, there, uh, the, the values that are there is low frequency, and, uh, and you can basically just tell color out of this. There is just hue, mainly. Uh, so, and you can see that metals, since they don't contribute with actually color from the texture, they tend to be dark anyway. We've got the specular. This, as I was saying, this defines the material type. This is a very important texture. It gives small, there is a small variation in, in these textures among dielectrics, and uh, they are typically uh, monochrome 
or grayscale. On the other hand, metals, they inherit or have a hue that is very close to what the metal albedo or diffuse would have been. Uh, so in this texture, it's a bit bright, but you can probably see there's uh, some yellow patches, and those, in this case, are metal, naturally, and uh, it is uh, some sort of gold, I would assume. Um, so yeah, the suggested range for non-metals in the specular, it's about 40 to 75, preferably, uh, around that area. It's not, it doesn't exactly need to be that, but that would give you a good start, I think. And then um, 155 to 255 RGB for metals. It's much higher range, of course, to give that a shinier look. And uh, smoothness. So this one, of course, contains lots and lots of details. This defines, actually, the surface of your material. Uh, and uh, usually, it can range between 0 0.12 to 0.94. If you tend to go very high with the, with the, with the smoothness, it naturally will create a very unrealistic look, because there's very few materials out there that has a completely perfect uh, smooth surface uh, with, as for example, mirrors and such tend to have that, but uh, very few others. So this is the, the kind of the micro faceting of the, the texture that's provided there. And lastly, uh, occlusion. This is just generated any, any way it's typical. Nothing really unorthodox about it. So it masks reflections as Ray was referring to as well, and indirect lighting. So uh, it does a proper job there. So obtaining texture data, how can we do that? There's a uh, few different methods of doing that. The scanned ones, this is more the scientific method. I would definitely recommend that those of you that are not accustomed to making textures for PBR shaders, it's very good to use that as a reference to actually study and get to know your, how, how textures actually are, uh, how values exist for this shader. So for that, you can use uh, Substance. They got a database for that. There is uh, eventually mega textures will be, um, have some sort of um, database as well. And Surface Mimic, among others. Hand-painted hand ones, that, that's definitely much more time-consuming. Uh, to the, the, the um, examples I was showing you was very, very simple. But if you're going to make a comp complex material that shifts between different uh, surfaces, it will be very time-consuming to actually create them manually. And you have to continuously keep track of the values and match them with any kind of uh, 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 reference chart that is available. And you need to actually remove the, the lighting information as well in those textures, which tend to not be that easy. And then lastly, we have the procedural way of doing things. Um, and I will switch over to Ves that will tell you more about that. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Wes. I'm with Algorithmic. And uh, so what we've been uh, covering so far is, uh, let me just switch the slide here. So what we've, uh, what's been covered so far is we've had some theory about uh, you know, physically based shading and creating the content. So now what I'm going to actually focus on is some actual tools for creating this content. And so with Substance, uh, we specialize in texture creation tools uh, that are built around physically based shading. So our systems have been engineered from the ground up to work with physically based or actually to create physically based content. And so what we have is the Substance file. Now, the Substance file has been native into Unity for quite some time. But what that provides us with is a streamlined solution for PBS inside of Unity. And it does that through allowing us to basically have input not matter. So uh, Erland had discussed a moment ago about having some various types of inputs, such as scan data, 
Maybe it's um, you know hand painted uh, information. Uh, also, it could be just you know bitmap things like that. So the input that you get, whether it be scanned, procedural, or hand painted, doesn't matter. You can bring all of that in, package that into the substance file itself, and then pass that on into Unity. So in that case, what you have is the substance itself becomes the content delivery vehicle for your um, physically based content. And so with that, you get that streamlined workflow that the substance material comes in, that material is describing all of the physically based attributes of the surface, and it auto connects to the standard shader, and everything is already set up for you. But you also have the added benefit of having some exposed parameters that you can change uh, dynamically in the editor and also through the runtime. So, when you actually take a look at tools for creating this, we have Substance Designer and Substance Painter. Substance Designer being more, towards, uh, more geared towards technical art, also a pipeline. Think of it more like a hub for bringing all of your content together, creating Substance files. And then there's Substance Painter, which is a very artist-friendly tool, uh, 3D painting, layer-based system, very easy to grasp. And so we actually support two methods. We support uh, the Metal Rough workflow as well as the Spec Gloss workflow. And the, it is based off the Disney principled uh, GGX BRDF. Now, we've had this cross check through AAA Game Studios. The workflows that I'm going to show you in the next slides have all been uh, basically, I'll call it, battle tested through you know, production through AAA Studios. So, what I want to do is just kind of talk about this uh, concept of this material workflow. So one of the things that can really help uh, a great deal when you're creating physically based content is to, is to kind of break out of the mold of how we used to create maps as artists and not really think of things so much as uh, like we think of it the old way. You know, we're thinking of, OK, a diffuse texture, a specular texture, reflection texture. And we're thinking of these as separate elements that we're creating. When you're creating something that's physically based, all of the maps need to work together. Um, they almost really don't make sense too much if you're trying to author them basically one at a time. We need to think of them as what they truly are, which is describing you know, physical attributes of a surface. And so with our substance tools, you can easily do that uh, by adopting this material workflow. And so uh, here I'm going to use this uh, really cool laser pointer. Uh, so we have this material blending. So this is what this is showing right now is just basically just a, a, a quick node-based kind of graph from Substance Designer. I'll show you the more artist-friendly approach to that in a moment. But here we have some base materials. So we can look at this guy here as a, a dielectric material. We can look at this guy here as representing a metal material. Now, we are thinking of this as a single entity. So you notice we have one connection. It's just kind of piping through. But what's actually happening, if we take a look at this open, we can see that we're actually working with four channels at one time. So we're taking into consideration the channels, whether it be uh, your albedo, spec, gloss, and your normal, and how these are all combined together to describe what this particular material is needing to represent. So we have our materials together. We can easily blend those here using a blend node. And those materials are actually blended onto the surface very simply by just using a color ID mask that you see that I have here. So that was just baked using Substance Designer uh, off the material IDs from the mesh. You can see here that I can actually go over to the actual material ID. I can just simply select the color just select the color here, and it's going to take that material and place it uh, directly on the mesh. So if you kind of look, here we've got uh, the very first. This is like a raw metal. Then we have like basically a, uh, a painted layer on top of that. So another thing, since these are physically based materials that we're working with, we're kind of thinking about this more in terms of a real world um, you know, structure. So here we have like the raw material underneath. Now on top of that, I have what I'm referring to as a dielectric material. So we look at this as, well, this is a metal asset. However, it's raw material, but we actually have like this painted on top of it. So that painted layer that's on top of the metal is not actually metal. So we're layering these two materials together. So we have the raw metal, we have the painted, and then here you can see where they're actually being blended together. Now, once we actually have this kind of base structure together, we've layered our materials, what we'll do is we'll go through the process of adding some you know, weathering to this, some damage, and things like that. And so the way that you would actually do that, again, here I'll show it uh, just in this kind of visual graph representation, uh, is we have basically a color blend. So what we want to be able to do is we want to take some mass generators that you see here. So here I have something uh, that is going to produce metal edge wear. 
the next one is going to be scratches. So we have a, uh, an entire library full of these really quick preset solutions where you can easily add like we uh, all kinds of different weathering effects based off mesh data, such as ambient occlusion and curvature. And so what we're doing here is we're just piping this information here into our material. And what we want to be able to do is we want to say, I would like to have this metal edgeware. I'd like for it to basically chip off you know, certain areas of the actual paint, uh, of the painted layer, and reveal the raw metal underneath of that. And so that's the way that we're thinking this. We're not thinking of it as individual elements, but we're thinking of you know, how this effect or this metal edgeware effect, we'll say, is going to be, how is it going to propagate to all the channels? And so here you can see that we hook in the edgeware effect. We're applying it. We're chipping the paint away to reveal the raw metal. And then here you can see that I'm doing the same thing here, but just adding some scratches. So right here we just have a uh, little parameters window. Now, traditionally you would need to go through and think about, well, I've got this edgeware. I need to have this edgeware effect, this, this map here, this diffuse. I need to then have it affect you know, how it's you, you know, working with my specular, my gloss, my normal, and so on. Uh, but all we've got to do is just utilize our blending node, just come over to the slider and say, for instance, here's my glossiness. This edgeware effect is going to affect my glossiness with this value. This edgeware is going to affect my specular, since in this case, we are actually going to be uh, chipping away at, uh, and exposing some raw metal. So in that case, for specular, we want to make sure that we're using a very bright value that's going to represent that actual scientific measured uh, value for that metal. And so you can see here, we actually have a bright color. Now, if we take a look over at this image here, what this is actually showing is this exact same process except done in Substance Painter, which is a friendlier uh, 3D painting tool. You can see that here we have a complete just layer-based uh, solution on how we're going to work with and blend these materials. So if you take a look, each layer is the same thing as this material node here. So each layer is actually going to um, comprise of a material. So the layer itself, you can see right here at the very top, I have my channels. That layer defines the albedo. It defines the spec gloss and the normal as height information. And then I can simply add here a substance effect to that. So here I have all my parameters for uh, changing and showing, like adding uh, edge wear, grunge, scratches, and so on by just adjusting these sliders here. Now, again, it's a substance, so it's a procedurally dynamic uh, method. You could also use your own grunge maps as, uh, if you want as well. And you can see that we're able to utilize this exact same process here, but just do it in a more friendly kind of Photoshop-like uh, layer-based system. So uh, that kind of brings me over to you know, Substance Painter a little bit more in a sense that you know, I had just demonstrated that uh, you know, we're working and we're thinking of our assets as materials. And then here we're doing the same thing. So I have this asset here. And you can see with the yellow um, kind of area that I've kind of called out there, we're basically able to take a look at our channels. So in this case, now this particular uh, demonstration here is actually showing the rough metal workflow but it would be the same for spec gloss as well. So here you can see that I have channels for diffuse, uh, height, rough, and metal. Uh, right here for uh, my diffuse, which is actually going to be uh, labeled as base color, which would be uh, better for that kind of workflow. So right here we're looking at the actual specular reflectance value for that metal. Again, notice that it's a bright value. It's not dark. And so here we also have a roughness as set as the slider. And then notice here that our metallic is set all the way up at pure one, meaning that that is representing a metallic surface in that case, or a metal. And so again, we're able to just work this through this material-based workflow. Now, we also have uh, ready-made solutions as well. So a lot of times, you know, you're in a crunch or it's not something that you want to work with. So there's several different ways that you can work. You can work with scan data. You can work with hand-painted. You can work with, um, you know, also you can work with ready-made content such as databases. So in this case, we have a, a very large growing library of, um, you know, PBR materials uh, as actual substance files. Uh, these are a mixture of hand-painted and procedural. And you can also utilize your own custom database. So let's say that you have built up several materials on your own, and you want to be able to utilize these, share these with the artists on your team. You can easily integrate your own custom database with this. Something else I really want to point out when it comes to creating this type of content, especially uh, on a, on a team-based environment, is that uh, you're able to actually create your own custom type tools. And I just wanted to just kind of show an example of how that works, because it really helps to speed up the workflow. So on the left side, you see that some custom nodes. So there's two nodes that I just created for projects I work on. One's a dielectric, one is a metal. 
And so you can see in the call out there with the, uh, the metal, so the little yellow box around there, what it allows me to do is pick what, f work fl uh, excuse me, what workflow I'm going to use. It allows me to have a yes, no kind of checkbox there if I want to supply my own normal map, if I want to supply my own height map. Uh, or excuse me, my own roughness map to that. So again, it could be some scan data that I'm feeding into this node. Uh, then I can go through and check and, and just tweak there my specular tolerance range for that actual dielectric material. And then for if it's, uh, if it's something that I want to actually pick different specular, I have a little drop down box. I'll just point it out right here. So right now it's set to plastic, but I could pick any other type of uh, specular reflectance values for that. And then here I have my range. Uh, we also have tools for being able to validate uh, the actual uh, content that you're creating. So if you're creating some content, you want to make sure that your values are right. There's things such as the PBR validation node, which since we basically have that full material, you have that material, you just pipe in that validation node, and then you can set a mode. So am I actually looking at the metal, or am I actually going to be looking at the albedo or the base color for that? And uh, you have a little tolerance range there that's kind of just fitting within the, uh, the correct tolerances for what that uh, reflectance value should be. And then from there, it'll just, dis it'll just display to you a heat map and let you just kind of see where areas might be incorrect. So for instance, if we look at my robot guy, and I see right here this area, which is supposed to be indicated as metal. So I've indicated that area as metal, so it goes and checks my specular reflectance value for that metal. And in this case, that value is very, very low. So in the case of uh, why that is an error, is I had some dirt on top of that. So I had my metal, I had some dirt on top. Well, the dirt on top's not actually metal, and I indicated that area that in that specular map. I actually indicated that area to be metal, and so that, that would be an incorrect um, authoring for uh, this type of, uh, you know, physically based content. And so my little heat map here lets me know that, hey, look out, you've got some uh, specular reflectance values that are too low. And then what I'd like to do is just kind of close out with the, uh, the idea of that, you know, how the native Unity support works. So the idea of being able to take this content and to be able to wrap this into a material, like I said before, the, the content delivery vehicle for that as a substance file gives you the ability to reduce the overall texture package size of your projects. You're able to change parameters at runtime. Uh, quick texture iterations right there in the e editor, as well as make your own custom tools, uh, abilities to work through, like if you have certain materials or certain things that you want to work with and that you do often, you can create tools that allow you to work much faster. So here in this slide, you can see that we actually have Unity 5 open here, uh, and the, uh, it's actually not shown here in this image, but the standard shader there is being utilized, and the substance material actually just plugs in correctly. You've got the uh, albedo texture, right here we have the spec, and then it takes the, uh, the gloss information and plugs that into the alpha of the spec, and then normal and ambient occlusion. And then here, I have a bunch of substance parameters allowing me to change the color of that, that painted metal. I can add where, I can dial it up and down, add scratches and things like that all directly there into the runtime. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it back over to Rinaldis. So thank you guys very much. So yeah, uh, so it's just to wrap it up, summarize. It's uh, it's really the, just think of it. The specular uh, and the glossiness are very important. Uh, it is really important to invest some time in generating of the assets, uh, looking at procedural generation of the scanning, uh, or underst and understanding the theory might help as well. Uh, there is, as well, uh, when we compare the, our new standard shader with what we had before, the, the question might arise, so now it's a very expensive thing. Before, I could, take, I could pick a diffuse and, and, and would be just, a very, just pick a very cheap shader and use it. Uh, and then on some object where I wanted some specular, I would take, I would, with the normal maps, I would pick another shader. So, uh, well, well, with our new workflow, it's actually much better. Now it depends what texture you plugged into the standard shader. If you plugged only the diffuse texture, uh, the shader will be, there is a special code which looks at the input of the shader and decides, okay, actually, the, I need to only a simple way of the, of the, of the shader. If, the, if only diffuse is used, I can turn off all those kind of unused code. And that part will decide and pick a special shader. So underneath of the standard shader, we actually generate around several thousand shaders, I think. And the code, the, the, the smart part, will decide which one to pick depending on your 
uh, inputs. The same thing with the mobiles. Once, it see, once the code sees that you are building for the mobile, it will pick a mobile path, which is, has a certain qu worse quality, but much better performance. Yep. Uh, so we are running out of time. Uh, do you have questions? Yes. Uh, meanwhile, maybe you can sh show the cat. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. So suppose we have an existing font specular material in Unity 4. What yeah. steps do we need to take to convert that over to standard shader in Unity 5? Oh, it's enough to change just a shader. The most of the slots will be automatically uh, converted. So, I mean, are we going to need to pull the output channel from our existing computer out and put that into a whole new specular map and things like that? <coughs> Uh, the alpha channel is on, on, on the diffuse, so you don't, usually you don't need to do that. However, the glossiness in the specular might be different, so you might either change the data or you actually need to go and tweak a little bit the shader afterwards. But in, for the most of the part, where we can, we convert it uh, automatically. Yeah. Yes. The shader on the terrain. So, uh, so far, it's in the same sad situation as it was before. Uh, for the Viking village, with, which Joachim showed earlier, I just created a shader which would blend two materials. So I, I just take a, the, 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 the modified the, 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 universe, the, the standard shader and just make it blend between the two of them so I could use it for the terrain, cost, custom, custom shader. Uh, in the future, we will have a, the terrain shader which will be based on the standard shader but not in 5.0. Uh, what was, yes, uh, the good thing is uh, the standard shader, it will be open source. So we are shipping it uh, as uh, a source. So you can take it and you can modify it. Uh, as, as, you, as we showed earlier, the, the car and the, the skin shader, the, 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 the artist just took, well, technical artist just took our shader and modified it for their own needs. Okay, I, I, think, uh, I think we are out of time. It's, we will be at the, at the booth uh, all the, most of the time, either at, at the hands of labs or at the booth uh, here. Uh, you can come and talk to us. Thank you.